Okay, so this is uh, section four, roadblocks to success. Physical roadblocks we'll talk about first, and then we'll go into psychological roadblocks. So I, I put this whole section in because just after practicing as a health practitioner for 10 years, I started asking the question, you know, how do I get my success rate for my clients up as high as I can get it? And I kind of narrowed it down to these two areas. So what I teach is just as much physical and sometimes psychological. So even for my really big clients, I actually, I, I really uh, recommend that they go see a therapist to kind of work with the therapist because some emotional issues can come up, but also and then working with me on a lot of the physical issues. Physical roadblocks. Addicted to sugar is a common one. Candida, which is a fungus, can cause carb cravings. Um, let me just go off here and talk. This is a, a quote from uh, Digestive Wellness by Dr. Elizabeth Lipsky. Candida colonies produce powerful toxins that are absorbed into the bloodstream and affect our immune system and hormonal balance and thought processes. The most common symptoms are abdominal bloating, anxiety, constipation or diarrhea, depression, fatigue, food sensitivities, insomnia, low blood sugar, mood swings, premenstrual uh, syndrome, and uh, bladder infections. So that's candida. So candida is a fungus that can start in the gut but become systemic and cause a lot of different health issues. Specifically, some of the toxins it produces will cause you to crave carbs. Hormonal imbalance, low testosterone, this is also a physical roadblock. Among men and women, they won't want to exercise because their testosterone levels are so low. Neurotransmitter, another reason why they don't want to exercise um, is they, they just feel really crappy because their serotonin is low or their dopamine or epinephrine or norepinephrine. They're, they're just completely out of whack. A lot of that has to do with food and, and different lifestyle choices. Addicted to gluten is a common one, like wheat, barley, millet, packaged foods. Gluten can act as an opiate. Gluten is actually really powerful. A lot of people that just are so addicted to, to eating wheat, it's because they want to get their fix. It has an opiate effect, and most people don't realize that. Hypoglycemia, we talked a little bit about that. That's low blood sugar. So you can control blood sugar by eating five to times a day, uh, protein and fat every meal. I know it's a pain uh, to eat five. <laughs> but you know, it, it does make a difference and it's, it has a huge impact on your health. So low blood sugar causes carb cravings. One of the common things, especially with women, is that they crave sugar. Um, a lot of that has to do, they don't eat enough protein and they don't eat often enough. Those are usually the two reasons. And the third reason is they eat way too many carbs. The problem with eating a high carb diet is carbs, will, you'll burn through your system much faster than protein. Protein's kind of hard to break down, so it'll stay in your system longer and you won't have those mega drops. Um, poor sleep causes carb craving. This affects leptin. So leptin's a hormone that's produced during sleep. When people have really bad sleep, quality or quantity, um, they crave sugar. Depression can cause carb cravings. Um, so you can medicate oneself with carbs, so carbs can st stimulate serotonin production. So these are all physical roadblocks that with my clients I start to work through uh, one by one, and usually these go away over time as your body heals. These are just all symptoms. These are all symptoms. So the question is, you know, what is the root cause? And the root cause always comes back to the same thing with nutrition, exercise, stress management, holistic life changes, and some form of lab testing to check under the hood and see what's going on with the hormones and with the gut and the liver. Our question. Yeah. How difficult is it to find out if a patient or a client has a gluten intolerance? Ooh, um, so there is a test that's called the mediator, MRT test or the mediator release test that I do with clients. It's not, it's not a primary test, it's a secondary a test that I utilize with them, but it tests for gluten intolerance. But the thing is, clients shouldn't be eating gluten anyway. You know, Maybe they might have it on their cheat meal like once a week, but if you're celiac, you definitely don't want gluten because you will react bad. Um, but in general, gluten's just, it's an anti-nutrient that you want to avoid like the plague. It's just not good for you. And you know, if your health is super optimal and occasionally you want to have like, I don't know, wheat bread, then go for it. But just realize that, that that's not promoting health. It's just, you're doing it just for taste. And you might be, it's the whole opiate effect. That's the reason why you might crave it, you know? So, go ahead. If you're through um, menopause and you, when, when you balance out the hormones, do you do it for a woman that's over menopause and you Absolutely. bring up her? Well, no, it would, be, yeah, it's going to be based on, um, uh, on the person's age and if, if they're still menstruating or not. All that's taken into account on the test. 
Now, one of the questions the test asks is if you're menstruating or not. But I know when they do the hormonal balance, balance and other, they give you hormone therapy. Do you try mm -hmm. it? It's like Suzanne Summers. Yeah, yeah. I bring her up yeah. when she was a young girl. That's right. Um, so I work part time at the Beverly Hills Rejuvenation Center, and I've had this top this conversation with with the owner quite a bit, and. So what, what we've discussed is basically if a person's over 40 and they want to raise testosterone levels, the reason why they hired me was to attain hormone balance in a natural way. So what Suzanne Summer supports is more of symptom care. So if you have low estrogen, then take estrogen. If you have low testosterone, then take testosterone. Well, the questions ever ask, why do you have low testosterone in the first place? Or why do you have low estrogen? What's going on? And that's where you start looking at the root cause. And in, in functional medicine, we call it blocking factors. And you begin to identify blocking factors or internal and external stressors. And as you start doing this kind of natural holistic process, testosterone and estrogen and, and progesterone, they start to normalize. Now, so what ends up happening is and this is what I do at the, at the clinic, if they've gotten better, whatever margin they fall short, that's where our HRT or hormone replacement therapy might play a role. Well, she wants her period back. I never want her period back. Yeah, I, I, yeah, yeah, no, I, I, I get that. I, I mean, I, to be honest, I haven't read her book, so I don't know what her, her theory is or her feeling. Um, my position on HRT is that it could be useful for people over 40, um, but they do need to ask the right questions. And I would do the, the, the hormone testing first to see where they're at and then try to fix their hormones naturally. And what margin that they fall short, um, they can make up the margins with some kind of cream, like a testosterone cream or, or other products that might make sense. So, um, can you use maca? I, I mean, like, DHA, yeah. I use DHEA. Well, with DHEA, you just have to be careful because you, you want to make sure you get tested because DHEA can get converted into estrogen. And est people that are estrogen dominant, that's actually a big problem. Um, so there is like when I do with my clients we'll do some DHEA but the drops that they put under their tongue it's like such small amounts it's tiny um, I think the drops like each drop only has 1.5 milligrams of DHEA and they'll only do like two or three a day it's very very different so, you know, mega dosing with DHEA can be a problem, but who knows, your body might be sensitive and, and your DHEA levels could get spiked, you know, and, and you don't even know it, and it could spike your estrogen levels. And so that's why if you're doing any kind of hormone, progesterone, pregnenolone, you always want to do testing every, every three, three and a half months just to see where you're at. Yep. Okay, so what can you do about physical roadblocks? Uh, holistic life changes and testing, we talked about that. By beginning to make holistic life changes, your body will begin to heal itself, and the physical imbalances and symptoms in your body will begin to subside. Beyond holistic life changes, testing can be used to identify hidden stressors that are causing many of the imbalances. So this is an important distinction. Functional uh, nutrition and functional medicine versus traditional medicine. So functional nutrition, which is, which is what I do with clients, uh, identifies that which malfunctions, corrects it, and allows the body to heal itself. Traditional medicine focuses on treating the symptom and not getting to the root cause of the problem. While this method can, can work for car crash victims or infectious diseases, degenerative disease and aging cannot be prevented with using this model. So like if you get in a car crash, traditional medicine is phenomenal. They, they will put your body back together again. Or if you get some kind of crazy, like preventing polio, that was kind of a whole, you know, with vaccines and stuff, that there can be a strong argument that, that shows that traditional medicine really Really, it can be effective. But with something like uh, cancer and diabetes, traditional medicine never really focuses on uh, disease prevention because there's no money in it. There's, there's no profitability. The profits are in the pharmaceutical companies making money and telling someone to eat healthier, which prevents disease, actually goes against their model because um, pharmaceutical companies will just make less money. So. Um, what I recommend is the, the prevention model and the self-care model, teaching people how to uh, uh, eat healthier and, and exercising and managing their stress and, and doing some form of lab testing to identify malfunctions before things get worse. Because symptoms, if you have any symptoms, like I had people raise their hands if they had more than three symptoms or more than five symptoms, those only get worse over time. They never get better. You have to do something about it. So. 
Functional nutrition is, is, it gets to the root cause of the problem. And traditional medicine, like I'll give you a per perfect example. So I started working with my dad, he had heart disease, and he had like eight different stints put in his heart. And he wasn't being very compliant, so I went, I flew to Gulf Shores, Alabama, and I'm like, okay, Dad, this is what you're gonna do. And I sat him down and said, this is what you're gonna do. So he was on eight different medications, and he's like, all right, I will commit to this, because it's really scared the crap out of him. He was really scared, like he was gonna drop dead. So he followed the program, and over time, he went from being on eight medications in really bad labs to now he's only on two medications and his labs look great. And we'll talk about lab testing and what that means. And he's so much healthier and he's so much more energetic. My dad's 63 now, 64, and he feels phenomenal. And he's lost, like he was like 235 or 238 when he started and now he's 194. Um, same thing with my mom, she's lost like 30 pounds of body fat. So they look better, they both feel better, but I, you know, I had to have that conversation with them in order to, to motivate them and, and he really, I have to hand it to him, he really did a good job of changing his life. Um, back to the pharmaceutical medications, I, I never tell clients to go off medications. That's, that's, the doctor recommends the medications and what happens over time is the body begins to heal itself. When my dad goes back for a checkup every three months, there's less of an argument to be on a medication if his blood pressure is normal and his cholesterol is normal, et cetera, et cetera. So what I do with clients is I tell them, look, stay on whatever medications you're on and just do testing every three months. And then the doctor will take, take, take you off medications based on your labs. And so a lot of clients over time, over a three month period, then a six month and a nine period, usually they'll start peeling off medications because their body's healthier and they don't need them. Four steps to health, good nutrition, protein with every meal, organic local produce, grass-fed meats and balanced meals. Uh, exercise, this can stimulate fat loss and build muscle, increase testosterone and growth hormones and detox the body. You wanna find the right exercise program. Holistic life changes, optimize sleep and digestion, stress management, meditation, yoga, walking. Limit toxin intake and create a healthy outlook. Lab testing, find out if you have a parasite, fungal infection, bacterial infection, hormonal imbalance, and improper liver function. So that's the four steps to health. Oh, question. Good. About the poster alignment that you recommend, yep. what is specifically what you do? Well, it depends. So that's, those are specific exercises, and, and it depends on what uh, type of misalignment people are in. So some people, you know, I'll do a, uh, an assessment in the beginning, a physical assessment on day one, and some people will have forward shoulders. Um, you know, some people will have tilted hips forward or an interior pelvic tilt. There's a lot of different things, or they'll have forward head. There's a lot of different exercises and stretches that I'll promote or suggest so that people can begin to change their posture alignment. Yeah, but that's kind of like hands-on stuff that I have to like teach the person how to begin to change their posture. So sleep, really important, this is the foundation of health. Sleep helps optimize hormone function, which includes growth hormones, testosterone, and cortisol. So tips for good sleep, most people have pretty bad sleep. 10.30 p.m., go to bed, we've talked about that. You really want a dark room. Um, I was at a conference and this one practitioner was talking about a research study where they actually had a laser light like this and they were shining it on the forearm or on the leg of, a, of the patient or the research subject and they were also they were monitoring his melatonin levels and what they found that this laser light started affecting his melatonin and melatonin is a sleepy hormone. So what's the point? The point is light affects your melatonin. Light affects your ability to fall asleep and get good quality sleep. You want your room like a cave, like blackout curtains and super dark. Like little lights like that are gl glowing off your DVR or your computer, those are all, you wanna like put black tape over it. It does affect your sleep. The body is so light sensitive, whether it's your eyes or your skin, I mean, what I try to do is uh, get clients to power down at 9.30 and start dimming the lights. Uh, a lot of that has to do with uh, lights really affect melatonin production, so they're not gonna get that sleepy. Um, I also have clients that have sleep issues do an Epsom bath salt soak before bed for 20 minutes, that is loaded with magnesium, and journal. Uh, Journaling is very effective. I call it emotional vomiting. <laughs> it's a way for, people don't realize how much anxiety they have before they go to bed. Um, there was a cool story, I can't remember what book I was reading, but we were talking about Napoleon, I think it was like 1805 or 1806, and 
at the time, you know, he ruled most of Europe. And one of his uh, advisors was asking him, how do you fall asleep? I mean, you're like, you know, own most of the world, uh, well, part of the world. Anyway, and Napoleon would say, well, you know, I just write down all the things that I have to do and, and then put it in my drawer and then go to bed, you know. And so the journaling is the same principle where, you know, you're just kind of getting a lot of anxiety out on paper. It slows down that fast moving anxiety response that the brain is flipping out over and it, it helps increase quality of sleep. The other thing, maybe try melatonin. Melatonin is really, uh, it can be effective, but I would just do small dosages. Um, light stretching before sleep helps with the quality of sleep. So that's another thing. I'll teach clients to do some basic light stretches for like 20 minutes and that's really, really helpful. I did it last night before, so I'd have more energy today. <laughs> I don't do it every night, but I do it quite a bit.